Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India to this eighth lecture on the course on human behavior. Now, we will start off this lecture by quickly reviewing what we have done in the past seven lectures. We started off in the first two lectures by introducing the field of human behavior and the field of psychology and there we discuss things like why do we know uh, need this course on human behavior. The answers were probably to study what humans do and how they do and it is required because humans being like to have much better interaction or a much better life than they normally are having. We then looked at the history of how the course of human behavior or the study of human behavior progressed. We started by describing questions from physiology, questions from philosophy which led to the study of human behavior questions like what is the soul, what is the mind, how the soul manifests the mind, what is behavior and questions like that. Also whether the mind and, and soul are they blank at, at, at the time when somebody is born or they come with pre experiences so this is the philosophical questions. On the physiological side questions like how does the mind do what it does, how it controls the body and all else, that kind of questions. So that was the uh, basic history of how the field started off and from where did it break. Then we looked at the history of the psychology itself which is the science which studies human behavior and we looked at some primitive schools like structurally school, functionally school, the two early schools and the gestalt school which is a direct opposition to the structurally school. We also looked at uh, two more schools, the behaviorist school which is entirely different from what the structuralist, behaviorist and gestaltists do because they say that human behavior or uh, human actions are kind of a reflex. So, there is no organism or there is no intelligent being in between. And then finally, the idea of psychoanalysis or uh, the psychoanalytic school which believes that most human behavior comes from hidden desires in the unconscious. We also looked at certain uh, paradigms and uh, certain uh, new sciences uh, which, which has now come up with psychology uh, like psycholinguistics, cognitive neuroscience, behavioral neuroscience and things like that. Towards the end of this lecture we looked at some fields of psychology uh, and, and we also looked at how to do research in psychology for example, the methods of experimentation, the methods of uh, uh, the observation, literature review. And, and all other methods of doing uh, psychology or studying human behavior. The next set of lectures were on understanding uh, those receptors or understanding those uh, processes and systems which encode the physical stimulus into the uh, psychological world. And there we looked at two parameters of systems and processes which encode the physical stimulus into the psychological realm. So, two parameters that we focused on was sensitivity and sensory coding and in sensitivity we looked at two sensitivities, we looked at two basic thresholds or two basic parameters of sensitivity or two basic characteristics of a sensitivity which is defining the absolute and the differential threshold. Further to on we looked at something called uh, signal detection theory which describes how human beings make intelligent guesses or human beings detect stimuluses in the environment. Now, the reason for understanding or bringing up the, uh, the theory of signal detection in humans, but not in most other uh, physical devices or physical devices which, uh, 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 which measure or which encode information or detect information is that human 
mind or human brain, the, it has a lot of background noise and this noise is created by uh, those functions which make humans leave. So, all those functions which, which carry out your everyday day to day activities, the autonomic functions, they create a lot of noise and so human beings uh, have to uh, detect external stimuluses or encode external stimuluses on the background of these noises and so the theory of signal detection comes in. Now, within the theory we have uh, described how the theory really works and what are the parameters of the theory and what are the characteristic of the theory. So, those, those are the things that we discussed there and further to on we looked at those biological process or those biological systems which encode uh, <coughs> the, um, the physical stimulus into the biological uh, stimulus. Towards the end of that lecture, we took a model system which is the human eye and explained to you how the human eye uh, uh, functions and how whatever we have read or whatever we have discussed in terms of sensations and, and, and sensory perceptions, how does they uh, function in relation to the human eye. Then we looked at something called perception. Now, what is perception? When the sensory system encodes information into the psychological realm, a meaning has to be generated from that uh, particular uh, uh, stimulus or that particular information and so perception is basically the way of generating meaning uh, from those stimuluses or those information which has been inputted to the sensory systems. Now, perception as uh, we discussed is a five part process it starts by putting up attention which is basically focusing on what information to grab and what information not to grab and how does this attention work this was the subject matter of that particular section. Then we looked at something called localization which is basically locating where the physical stimulus that has been encoded where it is in the external environment and this is necessary because any kind of navigation any kind of mapping has to be done on locating the external stimulus in the extra in the environment. The third step is basically uh, the recognition process which basically defines or which defines how humans recognize what they are seeing in the external environment or what has been encoded in uh, through the sensory systems uh, in into the human brain. So, recognition is a is a two part process there is something called early recognition and there is something called late recognition. In within early recognition it is all about feature detection the binding problem and, and that kind of uh, how primitive information is glued together and information is extracted out of it. And within the later recognition the comparison or uh, the matching data matching is, is uh, goes on. So, here what happens is we, we uh, whatever information comes from the uh, uh, simple simpler steps or from the primary recognition steps those information or those uh, information bits are then compared across multiple uh, uh, information multiple uh, multiple information models which have been already stored in the brain and this is called uh, the, the re later recognition process. So, basically it is pattern matching kind of pattern matching. So, you have a pattern which has been generated from uh, the sensory systems and there are some patterns which are already pre saved in the brain. So, how do you match that is what the later recognition systems is all about and so there are several model we have the simple model and we have the complex model and so simple simple model is a one way model and the complex model is a feedback feed forward kind of a model. So, that is what we did in, in, the, uh, in the idea of how recognition happens. Further to that there are two more steps to it one is uh, the idea of abstraction how the human brain extracts those information which it is finds necessary from any kind of perception that is having any kind of information that it is having and then the idea of constancy which is maintaining certain ratios or maintaining certain constants in terms of the physical stimulus that the human brain is actually seeing. Further to that uh, we ended the section by integrating and showing you how this perception really works. Now, in the last class which was the first section on, on learning we looked at what is learning and what is the need of it and so we described learning as a relatively permanent change in behavior which is basically happening through experience. So, parts of it is relatively and permanent so it is relative to something and it is uh, it is relatively permanent in the sense that learning can always go back and relatively permanent change in what change in the behavior. So, basically it says that the behavior can always change back and then it happens how does it happen it happens through experience in previous memories. So, uh, part of learning or more of learning is in terms of memories and past experiences and a related concept to uh, learning is memory which we will see in the upcoming section. 
Further to that, we took uh, to understanding what is learning or what learning is all about and we saw there are two types of learning we have something called the non-associative form and we have something called the associative form. So, what is the difference in the non-associative form a single stimulus is what causes learning or the learning is based on the uh, single stimulus two finds exist one is sensitization the other is the habituation and so there is some primary differences with that which we looked in the last lecture. Since our interest is more into associative form of learning we took one of the forms of associative learning now associative forms of learning is basically uh, a form of learning where we make associations between multiple stimuluses or a stimulus and a response and that leads to betterment of behavior or change in behavior and so in within the associative form we have three different forms of learning we have the classical conditioning we have the instrumental conditioning and then we have the uh, inst, uh, the, uh, the complex learning or basically the observational learning. And so, uh, we will start with a brief review of what we did in the last class. So, associative learning is divided into the classical conditioning the operant conditioning or sometimes it is called the instrumental conditioning and then we have something called observation learning. So, we did the classical conditioning in the last class, so we will focus very less into it. What is the primary difference? In classical conditioning, you have a reward which is given up front. So, a reward is given with a particular kind of a, uh, a particular kind of a stimuli and due to this what happens is the learning happens, right. So, it is reward contingent which means that reward leads to learning. In instrumental conditioning, what really happens is that the uh, subject it he does as a response and if this response produces consequences if the response produces positive consequence the behavior increases if the reward pre, uh, produces negative consequence the behavior decreases and so in in this case the learning is not reward contingent it is response contingent. So, you do something a particular act and because of that uh, certain uh, uh, either you get rewarded or you get uh, beaten up and so depending on what kind of consequence you get your behavior or basically your chances probability of doing that uh, act, uh, 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 act is defined by your response or the consequence of the response. In observation learning what happens is people keep on learning or the learning ha happens by observing someone observing a role model and so observing models or I would say observing role models and we look at all the acts of that the role model is doing and the, if the acts are rewarding the acts of the role model are rewarding we actually learn it if the acts are non rewarding those acts we do not learn. And so, <coughs> since we have already done classical conditioning let us start by investigating what is operant conditioning and as I said in operant conditioning what happens is you operate on certain behaviors. So, if there is a stimulus and this stimulus leads to a particular response, this response may have multiple consequences. If you have a positive consequences, the chance of you doing this act, repeating that act increases and this is lead to high behavior or high probability of repeating that act. If the consequence, so this is my response and this is my consequence. If the consequence is negative, the chances are that the repetition of this behavior will be very less in future. And so, uh, let us take an example. So, let us say that you show anger, that you, if somebody uh, says something bad to you, you show anger. Now, a bad word, a swear word is said to you. And because of that you respond by anger. If this anger leads to the other person running away, this is a positive response. 
right. And so, you in all cases where people tell you swear word, you will be angry. But in, in other words, if you show anger to a swear word, if somebody says you a swear word and uh, what happens out, uh, as a result of it, people do not run away, but they beat you up, then the chances of showing anger as a response to swear word will decrease and this is as simple as you can get to what is operant conditioning. Now, operant conditioning is more better conditioning. The reason being that classical conditioning only world, uh, works with natural stimuluses. Now, you have to remember that in classical conditioning what we saw is that there is something called the unconditioned uh, stimulus and the unconditioned response. So, the unconditioned response which is the salivation that we were getting has to be already get uh, linked with the meat powder. If the meat powder does not produce salivation on its own to start with, we cannot pair a tone to uh, uh, the meat powder and then get the tone to produce the salivation. But if we want someone to learn a novel behavior, for example, if I want my dog to respond to salivation through a tone, I can use classical conditioning because it is reward contingent. But suppose I want the dog to do something extra, I want the dog to actually roll on the floor or get me my paper. Now, if that is the question which I want, the dog is not going to learn by classical conditioning. So, what I do is instrumental conditioning. I will reward the dog if he brings the paper to me or if he approaches towards the paper or anywhere near the paper or fiddles with the paper. So, I will keep on rewarding. So, the dog now understands that if he if instead of uh, uh, wandering around, if he grabs the paper in his mouth and he brings it to me or if he some supposedly grabs the paper, newspaper or uh, letter or any matter of the fact of that behavior which we have a training, if, we, if he does something like that, then he gets a reward. So, he does that particular act again and again and so, if we want someone to learn a unusual behavior, to learn a behavior which he is not uh, linked to, which, which he has not been doing previously, the conditioning or the, the learning that you have to use is something called instrumental conditioning. So, let us start with what is instrumental conditioning, the definition of it. Now, what is instrumental conditioning? If you look into it, instrumental conditioning has been defined as that it involves learning the relationship between responses and outcome. So, basically if there is a stimulus and this is, uh, stimulus produces responses, let us say a stimulus produces two response, response 1 and response 2. Now, response 1 leads to positive consequence and response 2 leads to negative consequences. What will happen? people will actually do response 1 and not do response 2. The reason being that instrumental conditioning is learning what response leads to what consequence. Now, also it may so happen that if you have a stimulus and the stimulus uh, uh, response, the response to the stimulus might give two consequences, a positive consequence and a negative consequences. Now, on cases when it is giving positive consequences, people tend to do this act again and again, but if it is do giving a negative consequence or a negative uh, feedback out of it, people will not do this consequence, uh, this act. Now, uh, this particular theory or this particular idea that positive consequences lead to increased behavior is what is called the law of effect. The law of effect was proposed by Thorndick. E. L. Thorndick and what E. L. Thorndick actually said is that those acts which are led by a positive consequences, people associate these positive consequences to the response that they are giving and that increases the likelihood of doing that behavior again and again. But if a thought or if it is a, uh, if a particular act leads to negative consequences, people relate this with the idea that uh, not doing this behavior or avoiding this behavior and so that is what the law of effective uh, law of effect is all about. Now, Thorndike carried out experimentation where animals engaged in trial and error learning whereby behavior strengthened immediately followed by reward or law of effect. And so, what was the original experiment of Thorndike? In or Thorndike's original experiment what he did was he took a cat and let me see if I have uh, the Thorndike's experiment. So, what Thorndike did was he took a cat and put the cat in a simple maze. So, I have a maze like this, 
right and this has a door a latch so what when they did was put a cat in this this is my cat of course you have to bear with me in terms of the drawing and so this is a latch this is what the door is and out just outside the the cage is fish right some some live fish yeah of course funny but you have to bear with me so here is my cat and what tondek actually did was took this cat and put into this particular kind of a and uh, in enclosure and put the latch onto this thing now when uh, the cat was put in and there was fish outside the first act that the cat did was raised it uh, elbow and raised it paws and tried to get the fish but it, when it didn't get the fish it uh, started going all around the uh, cage and doing all kinds of behavior now what happens is one one of the times she actually hit the latch and the latch opened the cat could come out and eat the fish as soon as that happened thondek again took this cat inside this uh, particular cage and the cat again did some of the behaviors and so for multiple in multiple versions of it what happened is cat actually did most of the behaviors that was happening but as time progressed what thondek saw is that many of the irrelevant behaviors the cat stopped doing and there was a time when as soon as the cat was put into the cage it actually opened the latch and started eating the fish and that is what is the law of effect the cat realized that doing all these unnecessary behavior it learned by something called trial and error so what it learned is that it doing unnecessary behaviors is not going to reward it so it learned the behavior that what i have to do is open this particular latch and if if i open this latch the door is going to open and i can get the fish and so what thondek said is that is what is basically the idea of trial and error and this is how people learn or in this case the cat learned about the fact that it is going to get the now another kind of uh, experiment that was done on instrumental conditioning was done by someone called b f skinner so skinner's experiment was more simpler than what thondek did and so what was the experiment now skinner's experiment involves putting a hungry animal in a box which is bare except for a bar with food dish under now animals initial rate of pressing bar through ex exploration is the baseline level and so what thondek actually did was he designed a more simpler experiment in this experiment as you can see this is a rat right and so the rat has been put in this particular kind of a box now this box has one lever and as you can see the lever is here somewhere this is where the lever is uh, and what the cat uh, the mouse has to do the mice has to do is uh, press this lever now initially and this lever is attached to a food pipe so as you can see this is food grain and this is a food pipe and this is an electronic system which tells how to deliver the food and so what the rat actually does is the, and this cage is empty there is nothing here except one lever which is there what the rat actually does is initially the rat doesn't do anything so it keeps on doing a lot of things and so it uh, uh, it in one of those times it presses this lever when it presses this lever it gets the food so what the cat realize what the uh, rat realizes is pushing this lever actually the, delivers the food and so when he realized that he started pushing the uh, the uh, lever more and more and started getting more food or food at a very higher rate so initially how this experiment was done initially there was no food given to the rat and so it uh, a baseline was established it was seen that how many times the rat actually pressed the lever and that was called the baseline of pressing or the baseline level of pressing after that what happened is the rat was then a, a paradigm was formed in which the food was released and so the more number of times or the more harder more number of uh, presses that the rat was doing the more number of food it was uh, it was getting and that was the uh, experiment which skinner had designed for itself and it's a more simpler experiment to understand how <laughs> this instrumental actually uh, instrumental learning actually works or instrumental conditioning actually works and so what is happening here as the rat pushes the lever the le the there is consequence so more you push the more the higher push you do the higher consequence is high food and so what the rat is the more push you push you will get less food so what the rat started doing is pressing it higher and higher and getting the food now acquisition and 
extinction. Now, similar to the acquisition and extinction that we are seen in classical conditioning, uh, acquisition and extinction also happens in instrumental conditioning. What is it? Now, how do uh, the rat acquire something and how does the ex extinction happen? So, after the baseline is established, each time the, rat, the bar is pressed, food is released which results in frequent pressing of the bar. Now, this is the acquisition part of instrumental conditioning. Remember acquisition in classical conditioning, how does it really work? What happens in classical conditioning is the more number of pairings that you do, the more frequent pairings that you do of the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. So, in, in terms of classical conditioning, the neutral stimulus plus the unconditioned stimulus, the more number of pairings that you do, the more is the unconditioned response and better is the learning. And this is these trials in which the neutral stimulus is paired with unconditioned stimulus is called the acquisition stage. In instrumental conditioning, after establishing a baseline because you do not know how many presses uh, or how much the rat was already pressing and so or how many times the rat is going to press the lever. So, we first establish something called the baseline and baseline is the value or baseline is the number of presses the rat is doing uh, of the lever irrespective of it is given a food or not. Once the baseline is established, the food is started being released each time the, uh, the lever is being pressed. Now, if food stops being released, then similar extinction of response as in classical conditioning happens. So, both acquisition and extinction, in extinction do you remember what is extinction in classical conditioning? So, what happens is, at a point of time what happens is, when the neutral stimulus is given, which now becomes the classic, uh, the condition stimulus starts giving the condition response. So, the tone produces the salivation, but soon, sooner or later the dog realizes that it is the tone which is making him salivate and he stops and this is what is called extinction. In terms of my instrumental conditioning also, there will be a point uh, when the rat will not get any food by pressing the liver and so uh, if the food stops being released, then the rat will not press the liver anymore and this is what is extinction. As you can see here, this is where my rat is, this is where my food particles is and the person who is sitting here and designing something on the computer is how many trials will I actually give the food. And this is very funny because it tells will press liver for food. So, this is the rat who goes in into this box and presses the liver for food, interesting. Another experiment that uh, B. S. Skinner did was with pigeons and so uh, what he did was he was teaching something called avoidance learning and uh, it is it's a little bit higher than instrumental conditioning because what, what is being taught to this pigeon is to respond to green light and not response to red light. And so, the basic response to the pigeon is that it pecks. So, uh, what Skinner did was he created a pecking system like this and so there are two lights here a green light and a red light and when the green light comes in food comes in but if the red light is flashed food does not come in and so what the pigeon learned is to respond to the green line and not to the respond to the red, uh, red light and that is what is there. So, pigeon sitting, pigeon pecking key, pigeon being rewarded that is what it is you can see the food and so this this particular experiment was to fi uh, find out whether people can discriminate between or pigeons can discriminate between two different versions of the same stimulus which has been given to it or two versions of the. Uh, uh, response to versions of the stimuli which has been given to it. So, can it discriminate that and can it also study the consequence because the consequence will tell if the behavior will increase or not. Now, what is the nature of operant conditioning? Let us have a look at that. Now, in operational conditioning or operant conditioning, the probability that a given behavior will occur changes depending on the consequence that follows it. As, as I have said again and again, what happens in operant conditioning is that you do a particular act, you do a particular behavior to a particular stimulus. Let us say that somebody hits you, you become angry, this is the response. Now, if the anger is rewarded in some way, now consequence, what is the consequence of anger? There can be two consequences. If you by being angry, you make the other person who has uh, said bad words to you run away, this is a positive consequence. But in another case, if 
you become angry, the other person also becomes angry and the feud comes in or you get beaten up by the other person, then it is a negative consequence. Now, if it is rewarded in the sense that the person who says bad words actually moves away or runs away, then the positive consequence is there and so you will do this behavior being angry you know, on, on when somebody says a swear word that will repeat it again and again. But in the other case is the other way around, if, if you see that somebody says a swear word to you and uh, he beats you also, then you are not going to be angry anymore. That is what it is all about. Now, <clears throat> these probabilities are determined through four basic procedures, two which strengthen or increase reinforcement and two which weaken or decrease which is the punishment. So, <clears throat> there are two terms to be noted, one is called reinforcement and the other is called So, the consequences that I have can lead to reinforcements or punishment, right. The consequences that happens in class in instrumental conditioning can lead to a reinforcement or a punishment. Now, what is reinforcement? There are two types of reinforcement, so we will see this reinforcement, reinforcement is a consequence of a particular behavior. And so, what is reinforcement? The application or removal of a stimulus to increase the strength of a specific behavior, they are of two classes. Now, if you do a particular act and because of that or uh, if you get a particular kind of a consequence and because of that consequence, you increase the probability of doing that behavior again and again, this is called positive reinforcement. Right? So, what happens is if by doing a, a particular act, uh, an aversive and an appetitive stimuli, if by the by the in by the uh, uh, inclusion of an appetitive stimuli, if I in, no appetitive is basically first let me define what is appetitive. There are two types of stimuli. One is appetitive, which is a positive stimuli or liking stimuli, and the other is called the aversive stimuli, which is the one which is a negative one. Now, if an appetitive stimuli. So, let us say this is your behavior. If this behavior leads to an appetitive stimuli because of which a behavior increases, you say that this is positive reinforcement, right. So, basically how it is? The consequence if an appetitive stimuli leads to an increase in behavior, this is called positive uh, uh, a positive reinforcement and if the removal of an aversive stimuli, if appetitive stimuli is included, behavior increases, this is positive reinforcement. If an aversive stimuli is uh, removed and that leads to increase in behavior, this is called negative reinforcement. Now, let me first explain to you what it is. It is very easy to understand. If by including or removing a stimuli, a behavior increases or the chance of in, uh, a behavior increases that is uh, called reinforcements. Now, there are two classes of reinforcements, we will look at punishments also and I will also give you a lot of uh, uh, examples of how these are. What is positive reinforcement? It involves the impact of positive reinforces, stimuli events or consequences that strengthen responses that precedes them. Let us say that you do something good, you get very good in exam, good marks in exam and because of getting this good marks, you actually get a bicycle from your parents. Now, the chances are, what is the chance? The chances are that always you will do good in exam because you never did this act of getting good marks because of the bicycle because it was not promised at all. And so, what happens is that you actually did good in exam on your own and that was followed by a positive consequences and the positive consequences is the act of getting a bicycle or getting a reward, any reward it could be and because of that you are happy now. And so, you will do good in exam because now what has happened is doing good in exam actually gives you a reward. So, what happens here is that the initial behavior which is doing good in exam was not rewarded at all. Had it been rewarded, it would be classical conditioning, but the very act of getting good marks led to a partic particular positive act, a particular positive reward that you get and this is called positive. Uh, reinforcement. But let us say that you want to study, right or uh, you have friends uh, who are intolerable in, in your hostel room who are sitting. Now, one way 
uh, to un understand is positive reinforcement. So, what you will do is since you do not want to get into any kind of trouble, you will avoid going to your room when your friends are present who are very abusive. And so, here what happens is an aversive stimulus and uh, by removing a stimulus, what happens is you are feeling positive or you are rewarded. So, by not going into your room, you are rewarded because you do not face that situation where uh, you, you have to fight or tolerate these uh, friends of yours who are very unlikable. So, friends of yours who are sitting in your room and very untolerable and you do not want to meet them, what you do is you avoid the room altogether, do not go to the room and that leads to positive consequences because then you do not have to fight with this, these people or uh, say anything to it, uh, these people. And so, this leads to positive behavior because each time you see these friends together, you will avoid them and by avoiding them, you feel happy and so, this is called negative reinforcement. So, negative reinforcement is a situation in which a stimulus is taken away and aversive stimulus is removed. Something that you do not like is removed and because of that, what happens is you feel good and so you do this behavior again and again right so uh, something that is to be avoided so negative reinforcement as i have already explained involves the impact of negative reinforces stimuli that strengthen responses that permit an organism to avoid or escape from their presence so in one case if you do good in an exam and because of that you get a reward you do that behavior again and again, this is called positive reinforcement. In the other case, you avoid your friends because they are not good and by avoiding you feel better or you feel happy. So, that is also uh, a kind of reinforcement, a kind of reward, but this is called negative reinforcement. Similarly, there is a concept of punishment. What is punishment? It refers to the procedure that weakens or decreases the rate of a behavior. Now, there are two classes. Remember that reinforcements. increases behavior, whereas punishment, they decrease behavior, that is the primary difference, right, that has to be understood. See punishment, if you give punishment, a particular behavior will decrease, but if you give reinforcement, a particular behavior is going to increase and that is the difference between the two and within the increase of behavior, there are two kinds, one is called the positive reinforcement, the other is called the negative reinforcement. Similarly, we have punishment and so as I said, punishment is something applying a stimulus. So, uh, applying an aversive stimulus, so if you give an uh, aversive stimulus and because of that aversive stimulus, a uh, behavior decreases, this is called positive punishment or in other case, if you take away an appetitive stimulus, if you take away something that the person wants and because of that, a particular behavior decreases, that is called negative punishment. So, let us understand what they are. It refers to the procedure that weakens or decreases the rate of behavior. There are of two classes, positive punishment. Behaviors are followed by aversive stimulus events that terminates, that, uh, that, that is termed as punishers. For example, let us say that you are two brothers and so you fight among themselves or you fight among yourself and so you hit your smaller brother, he cries and because of that, you get a good beating from your parent. Now, this behavior of hitting the brother, which leads to punishment, which leads to hitting by the parent is a punishment and so you will not this, do this behavior again and again hitting a sibling and that is called the positive punishment. But there is something negative, uh, there is something called negative punishment also. So, uh, what has happened here is a negative stimulus, an aversive stimulus, inclusion of an aversive stimulus, beating leads to decrease. So, beating you by the parent is the negative stimulus which has been included in the in the whole paradigm and that leads to the decreased behavior of not hitting the sibling which you have done. Now, negative punishment is a situation in which a positive stimulus is taken away from you and because of that, your behavior that you do to a particular stimulus will also decrease. Now, the rate of behavior is weakened or decreased because the behavior is linked to the loss of a potential reinforcement. What happens here is that let us say that you are driving on the road right? <clears throat> and you do not have uh, a helmet. Now, one way is to find you there and for the helmet, but a better way to teach you is using negative reinforcement, it is also called omission training. Something that you like is taken away from you. So, while you are not wearing a helmet, let us say the police wala takes away your uh, license or it takes away your vehicle only. Now, the vehicle is something that you that you liked and or the, uh, the, the license is something that you like and he took away the license instead of fining you for 
the particular uh, crime that you did which was not wearing a helmet and so taking away something that you like and uh, by that punishing by that punishing or decreasing your behavior so you realize that each time you do not wear a helmet the license will be taken away and so now you start wearing the helmet. So taking away something you like and punishing you in that way to decrease behavior is what is called negative punishment. Now let us look quickly look at some instrumental conditioning and the concept review table uh, types of reinforcement and punishment. So this is what my positive reinforcement look like, this is what my negative reinforcement look like, this is what my positive punishment look like and this is what my negative punishment looks like. There is a definition, there is an effect and there is an example. Quickly shift to the next one, here the behavior as you see can be encouraged, here the behavior is suppressed. If you look here, this is where the stimulus is present, this is where the stimulus is removed. So four different consequences, you have positive reinforcement here, you have uh, the presentation punishment, positive punishment, negative reinforcement and negative punishment. Four different ex uh, types and four different examples. Now instrumental conditioning, the basic principles of instrumental conditioning. Now in operant conditioning, organisms learn associations between particular behaviors and the consequences that will follow them. Now in order to understand this form of learning, two issues need to be addressed. First, why are certain behaviors emitted in the first place and the second is once emitted, what factors determine the frequency with which this will be? emitted. Two things have to be understood in understanding the basic principles. Now, uh, there are some related features uh, with instrumental conditioning is the idea of shaping and chaining. And uh, what is shaping and chaining? The shaping is getting behavior started and then putting it all together, right. So what is shaping? First of all, let us see and then I will give you an example. So shaping is a technique in which closer and closer approximation to a desired behaviors are required for the delivery of positive reinforcement. The organism undergoing shaping receives a reward for every small step towards the final goal. The target response rather than only for the final response and quickly related to this or very much related to this is the idea of chaining which is a procedure that establishes a sequence of responses which lead to a reward following the final response in the chain. Training circus animals requires trainers to establish a sequence of chain of responses, the last one leads to the final reward. Let us say that I am training an elephant or I want to train an elephant to ride a bicycle. How do I do that? Now elephants do not ride bicycle and so the only way to do that is first using shaping. So I will give rewards to the elephant as soon as it reaches near the bicycle, it holds the bicycle and so on and so forth and chaining is basically dividing the whole behavior right from the point where the elephant gets interest, interested in the bicycle to the point that it actually rides it. So I will break the whole behavior into smaller parts. The reward is given to when it approaches near the bicycle or when it does something, then it approaches the bicycle, then it touches it, then it sits on it, then it rides it and so on and so forth. So this behavior is broken down into several behaviors and then all of them are chained together in a sequence or mixed together in a sequence so that finally from the point of time that the elephant was not interested in the bicycle to the point of time that an elephant is actually riding a bicycle. Now by giving smaller rewards or rewards on each step of the way, I can make the elephant ride a bicycle. Always remember classical conditioning happens with natural stimuluses, instrumental conditioning can happen with all kind of stimuluses and so this is the pattern in which it actually works. Now there are certain uh, biological constraints also to instrumental conditioning. Now as with classical conditioning, biology imposes certain constraints on what may be learned through instrumental conditioning. Organisms find it easier and faster to learn responses if their behavior required to make sense at the ethological uh, level. <coughs> For example, there are certain behaviors that certain animals do not do or certain animals do. For example, rats are very good at digging. So if you want to teach it a behavior which is related to digging, it will always like it. But rats certainly do not like uh, certain other kind of thing, for example, playing a flute or, or doing complex tasks. And if you want a rat to do that, what it will do is it will not uh, like that uh, or learn that behavior. Or uh, for that matter rats like uh, digging. So what happens is if you give a rat uh, some money or if you give a, give a rat a counting task to do on a floor what it will do is it will take the money and bury it, burrow it or bury it under the uh, what do you say uh, under the sand. Now the, uh, the the proper behavior or the original behavior of the rat is burying things and so if you give it something it will actually burrow it 
right it will not play with it it will not demonstrate it it will not learn anything from it and so that is the biological constraint or in in the case of elephants elephants are not made to or bears are not made to ride a bicycle so sometimes what will happen if they feel very awkward or if they are not feeling good they'll take the bicycle and start hitting you with the bicycle because the original response uh, of the uh, elephant is not riding the bicycle but throwing the bicycle around with its tusk and so if it realizes it or some somehow something goes wrong it will start hitting you with the bicycle and that is the natural response the those are the biological constraints. Now, the role of reward delay in impulsiveness and procrastination, that is another thing to be read or the basic principle of instrumental conditioning. Now, operant conditioning usually proceeds faster as the magnitude of reward that follows each response increases. The more number of rewards you get, give to uh, people with each response, the higher the, uh, the Man, the more uh, uh, reward that you get, the higher the behavior or higher the consequence of that behavior will increase. Now, but the effectiveness of reward can be dramatically affected by delay reward, how uh, much time you are taking in between between giving rewards. As I said, stimulus leads to uh, response which leads to consequence which is reward, then behavior increases and if it is a punishment behavior decreases. Now, how long do you take to give rewards? That is also another effect which is there. Now, two factors to be the effect of reward delay can lead to if the rewards are delayed, if the rewards are not given. So, this is once uh, if this is one trial, multiple trials are there. If the rewards are not uh, g uh, given or if the reward that you get out, out of doing a particular response, if it is delayed by some time, two factors can happen. Impulsiveness, the tendency to often choose smaller immediate rewards over rewards of greater value that must that they must wait for is called impulsiveness. So, what happens is if the reward delay is too much, what will happen is the subjects or the person who is learning, he will choose smaller rewards and uh, rather than the larger reward. Also, something called procrastination, if the reward delay is longer, the procrastination also can happen. So, the tendency to put off until tomorrow what we should do today, the decision of facing procrastination is whether to perform a smaller less effortful task now or a larger more effortful task later on. And so, what happens if the reward is not given uh, enough or reward delay is there, people may also turn out to procrastination saying that I will not do it today, I will do it tomorrow and so on and so forth and that kind of delay they can do. Instrumental conditioning, basic principles. So, there is something called schedules of reinforcement or different rules of delivery of payoffs. So, how do we give the reward or what is the way of giving the reward? One of the ways of giving the reward is called the, con uh, the continuous reinforcement schedule In what happens is the reward is given for each kind of behavior. So, a schedule of reinforcement where every occurrence of a particular behavior is rewarded. So, every response that you get, you get a reward. Fixed interval schedule, a schedule in which reinforcement uh, for a specific interval of time must elapse before a response will yield. And so, here what happens is a specific time elapses and after that particular time a reward is given to you like you uh, get a salary. So, after 30 days you get the salary. Variable interval schedule, a schedule of reinforcement in which a variable amount of time must elapse before a response will be given to you or a reward will be given to you. For example, in this case, you can have bonuses and all. Now, fixed radi ratio schedule, a schedule of reinforcement or schedule of reward in which reinforcement occurs only after a ma fixed number of responses have to be emitted. Here, there are uh, things like when you work in a company, then you have to do uh, a fixed amount of job, only then you will get the reinforcement and so that is an example. And variable ra ratio schedule, a schedule of reinforcement in which reinforcement is delivered only after a variable number of responses have been performed. And so, here what happens is, uh, for example, uh, certain companies offer you bonuses or uh, certain payoffs, certain additional payoffs, that is what it is and so there is no way to determine when the payoff will be given to you or certain kind of th good things will be given, goodies are given to you and that is the variable ratio schedule. What happens is the variable amount of reinforcement, uh, variable amount of work has to be done uh, and that will lead to the reward. Now, if you look at this, this is my time axis and this is my cumulative responses, the fixed ratio, the uh, uh, fixed interval, variable ratio, variable interval and so what happens is which is the best one, the best one is variable ratio, this is the best way of rewarding people as you can see it is a line and it is a line from 45 degree angle. Basic principles 
concurrent schedules of reinforcement and the matching law. There is some concurrent schedules also. So, concurrent schedules of reinforcement is a situation in which two or more behaviors, each having its own reinforcement schedules, are simultaneously available. This type of uh, schedule has been used to study choice behavior in both animals and uh, humans. Now, sometimes what we have, what we understand is that one type of reinforcement or one type of reward is not working. So, what we do is we use two methods of rewarding people, one based on time, the other based on uh, uh, other based on uh, how much you work you do. And so, what is the matching law? States that the rate of response will match the rate of reinforcement the, which is provided and each alternative behavior produces. In other words, a rat will dis, uh, distribute its behavior between alternatives in such a way so as to maximize the reinforcement it receives for its efforts. So, if as soon as the employee understands that the reward is based sometimes on time and some, some rewards are based on time and some rewards are based on ratio, what it will do is as soon as the time for the reward comes, it will start, he will start working more and in terms of ratio, what it will do is it will work more on certain sectors or certain uh, things on certain areas for getting the reward. So, that is the matching law. Now, there is also something called the stimulus control of behavior signals about the usefulness or uselessness of a response. So, how do somebody know that this response will lead to reward or not and that is what it is called stimulus, uh, stimulus uh, control of behavior. Now, people and other animals, they readily learn to pay attention to cues in the environment that reliably signal certain consequences for their actions. Over time, people learn to make responses only to presence of these signals. This is called the discriminative stimulus. Stimulus is that signal the availability of a re uh, reinforcement if a specific response is made. In short, their behavior comes under something called stimulus control, consistent occurrence of a behavior in the presence of a discriminative stimulus. I will give you a good example to understand that. So, you read that and I will give you a good example. Let us say that. Uh, this is the salary day and mostly on salary days, if you want something from your father, you approach him, he is going to give you something good, some kind of a good gift. But then this is your parent coming in, the father coming in and this is a salary day. So, you know that on a salary day, ask him something, but then you see him in a good, uh, in a bad mood. Do not approach him. This is called stimulus control of behavior. So, although it is salary day and your, if the stimulus is the salary day and you believe that he has had his money and he comes back in, but then there is a response that you are seeing. You see that he is not in a good mood, do not approach him because if you approach him, you will never get what you want. And so, stimulus control of behavior is something like that. On most most normal occasions on a salary day, whatever you ask your father, you are going to get that. But if you see him in a bad mood on a salary day, never approach him and that is called the stimulus control of behavior because we look at this discriminative stimulus which is the bad mood which may not make him buy what you want to buy. So, do cognitive factors instru influence instrumental conditioning? Yes, several evidences seem to support the role of cognition in instrumental conditioning. For example, one is learned helplessness. It is the lasting effect produced by exposure to situations in which nothing an organism does work. No response yields reinforcement or provides escape from negative events. Now, this is learned helplessness is a technique which has been uh, or, or a uh, situation which has been de de defined by Martin Sigmund. What happens is if people see too many negative consequences or too many negative negatives happening in their life, they give up everything and they stop responding at all. This is called learned helplessness. Now, in this case, if stimulus responses were based on the reward, what would happen or one of those schedules of reinforcement would work, what will happen is that each consequence or each response that the subject does is independent of each other. But what happens is in learned helplessness, people look at uh, multiple negative consequences that has happened and they stop responding at all. That is called learned helplessness, a situation when people start believing that they cannot do anything in, the, in their life and they give up everything. And so, that says that cognition works because what happens here is it is not stimulus which uh, behavior or stimulus con behavior related consequences which is telling you or which is making you learn what has happened is the thought process has made you not produce consequences or not produce uh, responses to stimuluses and so you never get a consequence out of it. Research suggests that learned helplessness stems partly from our perception of control. When we begin to believe that we have no control over our environment or our lives, we stop trying to improve the situation. Now, whereas stimulus gives to response and this response leads to consequences, when people start believing that these consequences are not in, the con in their control or not in the control of the responses that they are giving, they learn, they tend to do something called learned helplessness. In addition, genetic factors like inherited 
impairment in the ability to experience pleasure for example hypohydonia can also lead to learned helplessness so there are some genetic factors also which lead you or lead people to uh, present this idea of learned helplessness now there is also something called the contrast effect which tells that cognition or cognitive factors cognitive factors decide operant conditioning. Now, behavior is influenced not only by the level of reward we receive by our evaluation of rewards related to our experience with the previous reward. So, it is not only that each stimulus will is related to a particular reward which is related to a consequence. It is not as simple as that. This response that people give to a particular stimulus is dependent also on what previously responses we have given or what kind of reward we have actually uh, received previously. Now, uh, in this case what has happened is uh, uh, people uh, when uh, they were the, they were uh, there is two group of people one group of people were given reward high rewards and one group of people were not given uh, or uh, actually any reward and so when they were given high reward their behavior surpassed the behavior of people who had higher rewards this is called the positive contrast in the other case people who were uh, not given re reward at all and people who were given some simple reward. So, people started when they were not given reward at all their performance went very low. So, the experiment runs in this way that when people were give, people were actually given some reward. Now, when the reward was increased their behavior increased many folds in relation to what the reward was and a higher reward was given to them and when a lower reward was given to them their behavior actually went very low below the standard uh, in comparison to the reward. So, there is no relation between reward and behavior and this is determined by previously how much you were given. So, initially what happened is a certain amount of reward was given to people, a, a certain amount of reward was given to people. When this reward was increased, behavior increased almost 3 times, but when this reward was decreased, behavior decreased by 3 times and that basically says that there is a cognitive perspective. Now, shifts in the amount of reward we receive can dramatically influence performance a temporal behavior shift termed as something called the contrast effect. Now, this can be of two types we have a positive contrast, positive contrast is when the behavior increase many fold to the increase in reward and negative contrast is when the behavior decreases many fold in terms of the reward that is decreased. Now, at the existence of contrast effect indicates the level of reward alone cannot always explain our behavior and that experiences with a previously learned reward and consequence ex expectations can dramatically affect our performance. Now, there is another interesting thing in terms of whether cognition affects instrumental conditioning and so what happens here is that there were three group of rats actually there were two group of rats. So, one rat was and these rats were placed in a maze. So, you, we have something called a eight arm radial maze and so what happens is the rat was put here and a food was put here. So, one group of rats was actually uh, given food and a reward and so this rat act, when given a reward this group actually went ahead and started going from one end to the other or uh, trespassing this or uh, traversing this uh, radial maze. There were other group of rat who was not given anything so they were put here and this rat had no reward and so they were not doing anything. Later on the second group of rats who were not given a reward to start with so no, no reward group was given a reward and so when given a reward this rats performed better than the rats who were actually given a reward to traverse this maze and this basically says that what the rats who were not given a food, they were not just sitting down, they were traversing the maze and they were learning something and they formed something called the cognitive map and this cognitive map actually helped them in traversing better than or doing performing better than the, uh, the, the rats who were getting no reward and that is the reason that this rat performed better which basically means that it is not only reward that is going to work, what is going to work is the cognitive factors of how you think and something like that. And the last section that we are going to do today is something called observation learning. So, what is observation learning? Observation learning is the acquisition of new forms of behavior, information or concepts through exposure to others and consequences that they can experience. As you can see is the father when he is tilting his back at a 45 degree angle and he, and the child sees that this is the best way or the child sees that this, the father can effortlessly move the back, the child also 
tilts the back at 45 degree and starts moving forward. So basically what is observation learning? Observation learning is a process where you actually see someone act in a certain way and when you see him getting rewarded or awarded because of their act, you follow that particular behavior because you want to get awarded in a similar way. Now this is the <coughs> consequence or this is the demonstration of uh, Albert Bandura's aggressiveness principle. So what happens here is that Albert Bandura took a uh, group of people or group of uh, children and showed them aggressive movie. So one group of uh, children saw an aggressive movie, the other group of children saw a non-aggressive movie and after that they were put in a room after the aggressive and the non-aggressive movie. So aggressive group was put in a in a room with a bobo doll and the non-aggressive group was also put in a room with a bobo doll. Now people, children who, who actually saw aggressive movie started beating the doll more and the children who actually saw the non-aggressive movie started playing with the doll which basically means that the observation of getting rewarded. So aggressive group actually saw the hero being rewarded for doing aggression and so they learned that and the non-aggressive group saw that no, not doing any aggression also is rewarded and so do they do that. So what factors, con conditions determine whether and to what extent we acquire behavior information and concept from others. So how do we learn from others? Bandura 1968 suggests that first in order to learn through observation, we have to put something called attention must be directed to appropriate model. We have to choose whom do we want to copy. We have to find out the right model to be copied. Second, what the model does and shares must be remembered. We should also be able to remember what the model is doing. If we do not remember what is the act that the model is doing for, for which it is being rewarded, then it is not going to work in any way. The third is the memory representation form at 2 must be converted into actions. Now this aspect has been uh, something called the production process and that depends depends on something called the physical capability. So whatever the mem uh, model is doing, whatever you have learned from the uh, model and put into memory for that that has to be produced back. Now first the, that depends on two factors, whether you have the physical ability. So if smaller children are there and see they see a larger model taking a gun and hitting someone, they do not have the physical ability to do that and so they cannot repeat that act. Also capacity to monitor performance and adjust till it matches the original. So the first is whether people have the physical ability and the second is can you monitor your performance. So if something goes wrong, if the model does not act, you remember you pay attention to the model, you remember that and from memory you are able to produce it. Now once you produce it of course there will be errors. Now do you have the ability to monitor what was the errors that you are doing in comparison to the, what the model is doing and do you have also the ability to not only monitor it but also correct it. If you have that ability then you can actually learn from models. And finally is the motivation plays a decisive role in observation learning. The last thing is if you have no motivation at all to do the act you will never learn anything observation learning. And so observation learning, the acquisition and later performance of behavior demonstrated by others depends upon something called extension, retention, production process and motivation. And production process is two step, it depends upon the ability that you have, the physical ability also, not only the physical ability but also the monitoring process, can you monitor and adjust. These are the two things that is required for observation learning to uh, uh, function. Now observation learning and aggression, a large body of research indicates that aggressions may lead, uh, we learn through, ag uh, through aggression. Apparently when children and adults are exposed to new ways of aggressing against each other, techniques they must not previously seen, they may add these new behaviors to the uh, repertoire and the last thing to be looked at is observation learning and culture. So basically this observation learning also varies from culture to culture. For example, some cultures are very good in terms of observation learning but at other cultures they are very bad at observation learning. So observation learning is also dependent on certain cultures and the way these cultures respond to observation learning. Now this part basically explains the fact that how aggression and observation learning works because what happens is when somebody sees the other person being aggressive and because of that he is being rewarded, we tend to uh, uh, to align ourselves with that aggression and we do an exact act which is matching that aggression. So that keeps in or that brings us to the end of this section on uh, learning and what we did today was we looked at what is called instrumental learning. 
so we went into the basics of instrumental learning what it is what is uh, what does it encompasses how it is done and the basic principles of reinforcements and punishments and not only that we also looked at the factors the cognitive factors and other factors which actually um, uh, uh, encompass the observe uh, the instrumental conditioning further to that we also looked at what is in observation learning, what are the factors of observation learning and how does observation learning actually uh, is, is performed. So, observation learning is a simple fact where you copy a model. Let us say you go to a uh, restaurant. Now, when you go to a restaurant, how do you eat something? Let us say that there is French food. How do you eat something? So, you see someone around you who is eating. So, generally you go to a restaurant. I will ask you a simple question. Let us say that there is a food. So, which hand should you, uh, should you use the uh, knife and which hand should you use the fork. Now, that that comes from the fact that by observing people in the restaurant you uh, you learn these things and that is what is observation learning and for that there are four steps and you have to follow those steps or you have multiple forks so which fork should be used for uh, eating the salad for the food and so on and so forth so, that, so basically learning these things or co uh, how copying others leads you to better betterment or better learning is what is observation learning all about so <coughs> this section was mainly a second section a continuity section on what we did on learning next session we looked into uh, more related uh, factor which is called memory and until we do that from now from here it is goodbye.